What's up? This is Stefan Oriol. Check me out on the Bootleg Kev podcast. Hey, before we get into this interview, want to shout out to the family at Imperial Extraction, man. Listen, that's all we've been smoking, these Imperial Extraction pre-rolls. And what's dope is right now, you can go get a loaded up two gram. I mean, this is that pink gelati, THCA diamond loaded pre-roll, premium, glass tip. You can go get a lot of stuff. Imperial Extraction dot com save 20 percent off your entire order right now just use the promo code bootleg 20 imperial extraction.com promo code bootleg 20 you can get pre-rolls you can get damn uh carts you can do whatever you need over there man imperial extraction.com promo code bootleg 20 let's get into the interview yo bootleg cab podcast the legend is here Estevan Oreo is in the building, ladies and gentlemen. I made it. I would like to say uh, I'm a fan. I've been a big fan of your work for a very long time. Thank you. We have had mutual friends for years and years and years. And somehow I've met you like in passing at random things, but like never really like had like the full like, hey, how you doing? You know, yeah, like, yeah. But uh, it's, it's good to uh, finally be able to, you know, meet you and, uh, and have you on the show, man. You're a legend. So Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I was so happy uh, a few years ago when the uh, LA Originals documentary came out. Because there was so much about you and cartoon story that, like, I kind of knew. Like, I kind of I knew you had, like, gotten your start with, like, Cypress Hill and those guys. Yeah. But I wasn't, like, fully aware. You, you kind of fell into, like, the photography thing, right? Yeah, exactly. It wasn't like a... Like, you didn't do it on purpose. It was like they, need, they needed someone to take pictures, right? Like, you kind of break down, like... Because your original role with Cypress was something else, right? Yeah, I, I met Muggs in 89, and then uh, through the clubs and all that, I used to work the door and at nighttime, and I did construction during the day. And then um, around 92, he was like, hey, I got this job that I, I want to, you know, that I think you're perfect for. And I was all psyched up, you know, because I've been kicking with Cypress from 89, 90, 91. And mm-hmm. then, you know, here comes 92. I thought, like, all right, cool. You know, I'm going to be rolling with them. He goes, but it's with these other guys, the new group I'm starting. I was like, oh, fuck, well, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll give it a shot anyways. I'll listen, you know, hear it out. And it was House of Pain. Shout to Everlast, yeah. And he goes, uh, you know Everlast? I go, oh, hell yeah. Because, you know, from working the doors, he used right. to always come with uh, Rhyme Syndicate mm-hmm. and Ice-T and all those guys. So um, it's, you know, the job is called uh, road manage or tour managing. Mm-hmm. And at that point in their career, there was nothing. It, there was just like a demo tape and the album Jump was Around gone. wasn't a hit yet. Nothing. <laughs> it was just it was just a demo, I'm sure. Yeah, yeah, it was just like, it was just, just getting pressed. And we were going to go do a press run in a van um, with different label reps. And we go around to college radio and do in stores right. and record stores. And it's different, you know. The people, Way different than what it is now. Yeah, people don't even know what I'm talking about. Serious right grind. Like a serious bunch of guys in a van going yeah. across the country, shaking hands. Yeah, Sh- same sharing rooms. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, going into record stores and and the and they play your song and you have to like perform it there with like maybe ten people in the store. Yo, the record store meet and greets are such a th- I just I miss them. Yeah, because you'd be able to see your like the underground rap group that nobody really knew about in your hometown. Yeah, and they might pop up at like a Zia Records or a Tower Records, and you'd be like, maybe there's twenty other people there to meet them, but you get to meet them. You know, get, yeah, get an album signed, get a poster signed, get one of those old black and white pictures signed. Yeah, yeah. So you would be lucky if it was a Tower Records. Most of the time, right. it was like a little strip mall record store, mom and pop spot. Yeah, yeah, and you're like, oh man, you know, like, but you had to do it. That was part of the that was part of the deal. Yeah, because if you did that, that store might give you better real estate with where they put your album. In. Right. Yeah, they so. might put you right front and center. Mm-hmm. So when everybody walks in, you're the first record they see, or yep. you know, they might suggest your record. Yeah. Oh, yeah. you like this? Well, you check out check For out sure. House of Pain. You that like used to be too. a thing. You would actually trust the employees at the record store yeah. to recommend shit, and they knew their shit too, yeah, which is they, crazy. They, yeah, they did. Like yeah. you could go in there and go, you know that song like. Um, 
you might sing pack them the it lyric, up, pack and it like, in, yeah, this is and it. they're like, oh yeah, let's jump around. Yep. You know, and then you're like, damn, how do they know like lyrics from every song to where yeah. they could just direct you it's to kind a of record? A super lost art form, being like a like a record store employee. <laughs> yeah, that was that was the shit. So that that's basically what it was was taking them to in source, taking them to uh, you know radio shows, making sure they catch their flights and their be on time mm-hmm. for you know uh, interviews, and then. It was if they have to perform, you know, help them out with all that. So I was like, yeah, yeah, no problem. The thing was, it was like um, the only catch in it all is there's no pay. But you do get your travel taken care of, your hotels, and you get this thing called per diems, which is 35 food. bucks a day for food. So if you save that up, you get 210 a week, and then you're living, you know, on, you're living on their free. dime. Yeah. yeah. But you have all your bills back home. So it's like you still have your rent and all your shit to do back home. So luckily, right at the beginning of that, Jump Around took off. And Mm. we started, you know, really kicking in. I think at the end of the summer, uh, the band was making like a Gia show. And just to play Jump Around and the intro is like a seven-minute dat tape. And um, so for every thousand they would get, they'd give me a hundred. So it was like 300, 300, 300 for the three guys, 100 for, you. 100 for me. So sometimes we do two, three shows a day so that I'm getting, you know, 200, 300 bucks a day. Plus your per DM. Right. Yeah. So it was cool. Yeah. I was like, man, this is great. I might never have to go back to construction or right. working in the door with a bunch of drunk dickheads, yeah. you know, they're yeah. all on the guest list. So it was cool. I was like, fuck yeah, I like this shit. And then we were traveling and meeting you all. You see the country, you get to meet people. Going to all the um, the um, the uh, record, yeah. uh, what do they call them? The old, back in the day, uh, Jack the Rapper. And all oh, all the conventions, new music, the cinemas, conventions. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So now you're seeing everybody that you ever listened to, mm-hmm. all in one place, and everybody's like going to these little showcases. And I was like, you know, I was like, I found the the job. Yeah, for just me. the fact to get paid to do that, and like, I don't, I feel like uh, that level of uh, I th- I, don't, I think that people who want to get into the music industry these days aren't impressed. Like like when I was growing up, I w- I worked for free at the radio station for yeah. two years because I just wanted to be there. You know what I mean? Like I was like, how can I figure out a way to just pay my bills through hip hop? Because yeah. this is all I want. That's all I love. You know. Yeah. So I would have been happy just you know with ten percent of the success I've had in my life. You know. Yeah, yeah. You know? So it's like like you said, like yo, you, you can. Leave a regular job, see the country, meet yeah. some of the people you are fans of, and like do something cool and and not have to worry about all the normal bullshit. So yeah, I, and then every night you're listening to dope music for sure. And then every day you're in the behind the scenes of the guys, some of the guys that are making the yeah. the hottest music out there. Period, Cypress, yeah. Funk, Dubious, House of Pain. Like the, our crew was fucking stellar. lit right then, you know. So. From there, it went to, uh, you know, we did a tour of the BC Boys, and we got kicked off because we were a little too rowdy for them. And, wait, wait, uh, you guys got kicked off tour with the Beastie Boys? Yeah. Wow. So was there then, an incident, or was there like a... Yeah, there was a little incident. Oh, wow. And um, we got kicked off, and then the Kara Lewis was our booking agent. Who's still you, doing her thing. You've heard that, you know, She's on the still Ra- very, very, Rakim yeah. songs. Yeah. So I, I always used to love to say that, you know, like... Yeah, who you know? Who do you guys do shows with? We, I'd say Kara Lewis is our booking agent. You know, from from the, yeah. paid in full, mm-hmm. and um, we. She was like, "That's kind of like a blessing in disguise because now I can book you guys one off shows and and you guys can do your own thing because the song is blowing up." Yeah. So we started doing our own thing, and then we went into the Soul Assassin tour mm. in '93, uh, and that was um, a funk dubious house of pain. Uh, Cypress Hill and opening up before them was the Hooligans which is uh, Alchemist, Alchemist and, and Scotty Khan yeah so that whole tour was off the chain like crazy everything that could happen happened and it was one of the best experiences of all of our lives for sure and then just real quick what was it like um, being around Alchemist as a kid, because obviously for people who don't know, Scotty Khan is a 
you've seen him in tons of Hawaii Five point. I mean, he's he's in a ton of movies. Uh, he's a legendary actor. His dad's obviously rest in peace to his dad. He's a legend as well. But Alchemist as a kid, you know, one of the most prolific just minds, musical minds we've ever seen. One of the goats when it comes to production. Uh, what was that like having them on tour? It had to be kind of like a rowdy tour. Yeah, it was definitely rowdy. It was off the chain, and and they were young, right? Because they, I don't yeah, think, they were fifteen. Yeah, they were kids. So, like, what yeah. was that? I, it was like, like my little nephews. You know, like I had to look out for them, and and uh, you know, kind of they were already doing their thing. You know, they were already uh, partying and right. hanging out with girls and stuff. So it was already like there was no. Uh, you, know, you didn't age, have to hide or, or, yeah, or yeah, sense like, or anything away keep from the them. kids over here they were doing their thing yeah and let's go smoke weed right. over here or whatever or you know don't let no girls around them they're young right. or whatever right, right, right. Like, they, they were, were already doing their thing yeah it was that was way past that point so now it's just showing them how to do it the right way you know like i kind of had to uh just take alchemist under my wing and then he started coming on tour with us after the hooligans and he was like our he was rolling with us. He'd help Muggs with the production stuff, and he'd help me on the tour stuff. And um, we had little like side hustles that we'd do uh, on the road, and um, just me and Al. You know, we asked the guys, like, "Hey, is it cool if we do this? This? You know, like, yeah, yeah. Go ahead, get your money, do your thing." And um, I mean, would I ever think like, "Oh, Alchemist is going to be one of the greatest producers of all times?" Right. Probably not, you know. Right. Just saw he was a youngster, a little kid, you know. But he was, he wanted to learn so bad, and he was so on it, and he was like on point. Even like helping me, he was like right there, like, "Hey, Al, can you do this? Can you do that?" He did everything right. It wasn't like nowadays. There's you know, there's a new generations, and they fuck up, and they're like, "Oh, my bad." And that's it. Oh, I did. I just fucked this whole thing up. My bad. My bad. That's that's some like, real shit. That wasn't now. No accountability. Yeah, no. I don't give a fuck. Yeah. But Al, there was no my bads. He was on it, you know. So you could tell he was gonna do something, you know, big. But you know, you never would know. You never know of right. anybody's career like for they're sure, gonna be sure. a Grammy uh, nominated or whatever, crazy, you know. But yeah. to see that is just such a like proud moment you know for us older guys that were around him yeah. when he was a youngster like nah, we i mean soul assassins is his legacy groom That's, him yeah. you know 100%. in uh in a good way in a good way of course yeah because now yeah that word is <laughs> almost that, like a bad, stay away from that word Jesus. uh so so that tour happens the soul assassin tour happens how do you kind of walk me through how you end up taking pictures well, I was also, uh, I bought a 64 Impala in 1989, and I had it as like an everyday, you know. It was your every, everyday ride? Yeah, bucket, you know, kind of had like rust spots and stuff, and it had these like rusted out like mag rims, and I just put sounds in it, it spent like 1800 bucks right. on the car. I probably spent another 1500 on just the sounds, and I would just roll that car around and just, Bump. you know be smashing in it and then i had a little work truck that i bought for 200 bucks somebody told me like hey i got this truck i want to get rid of it it's making this weird noise the guy didn't know shit about cars or anything oh yeah i'll take it off your hands you know and i took it to my homie he did like a major tune-up on it another 200 bucks and it worked perfect for 10 years crazy so i used that as my work truck and then i put the impala away my homie dc Donnie Charles, uh, he passed away in 94. He helped me strip down the Impala and um, put it all into the right shops. And then I just used my, my work truck for construction every day. But uh, he, was a, he was a manager of um, WC in the Mad Circle back then. Shout out to Dub C, man. And, uh, you know, that was Coolio, uh, mm -hmm. Crazy Tunes, Dub C's brother, rest mm -hmm. in peace. And then... Uh, uh, another guy, I think his name was Jim, but there was four of them. And uh, Donnie Charles was the manager of them. He had a thing called Hood Rat Records and a car club called Hood Rat Car Club. And then, so he helped me take my car apart. And so from building the lowrider and joining a car club in East L.A. Um, and touring, my pops was like, hey, man, you're doing a lot of cool shit. 
you should uh, take photos. But at that time, you know, cameras were like this big. They're big. You know, big clunky. It wasn't digital screens. Heavy you things. Had to yeah, you had, to, you had to learn shit. Yeah. You know, you couldn't yeah. just like cheat and look. You know, get it to the perfect place where For the sure. digital screen is like perfect photo, and then exactly. you go, okay, it's perfect. Click. Mm -hmm. You know, you just had to go with your instincts. You had to develop a whole row of film and hope three or four were great. Right. Yeah. If you got one, you were happy yep. because what can you do with thirty six good pictures off one roll of film right. of one shit? You know, so. It's, most people would always say old time photographers if you get one shot per roll like you're winning yeah and um so my pops put me on to taking photos so i would do that on my spare time from tour managing and i never really uh thought of you know i didn't really like the camera because i thought uh paparazzis or or tourists carry cameras around you know it looks kind of weird right so I would always keep it kind of like to the side. And then if I saw something cool or if the homies were there, I would be like, hey, let me get a flick, you know. And and I would shoot. I start off shooting all my homies from my car club in that, that world and then shooting us probably on the, the Soul Assassin tour. I started taking a couple flicks here and there. Right. Just, but, just for you. Yeah, just for me. Yeah. And then... Uh, the homies would see the pictures like we'd all kind of compare our pictures after and be like oh yeah let me see what you got let me see yeah. what you got and i would always notice that my pictures were a little bit different than theirs i would see theirs and be like oh man like <laughs> like we're right next to each other how did he get did, that picture how did how's mine look like this and yeah. yours look like that yeah yeah but i didn't want to say nothing right. you know, i don't want to hurt <clears throat> nobody's feelings or whatever so i just kept doing it little by little and then um <clears throat> As more people would see it, they were like, "Hey, this is this is pretty good." And the lady at the photo lab, she she dealt with all pros. She was like, "Hey, can I blow some pictures up and put them in the in the lobby of the photo lab?" And I noticed that she had done that with all the pros before, and uh, she did it. And she sold eight out of eleven of the photos. And she goes, "You know what? I've never sold that many photos here in the lobby of the photo lab, even of the big guys." And I was like, mm, okay, cool. Like, I didn't know what sh that meant, right. you know? She was telling me, you're onto something, you know? Stick with it. So um, I did a little bit, a little bit more, a little bit more. And then I found, um, the because I was a tour manager, I was the one dealing with all the magazines, the record labels, mm -hmm. everybody that was coming through, photographers, f you know, magazine Yeah, you were kind of like the f line of defense between... The gatekeeper. yes. So I would set up the interviews like the record label would send me a fax. I don't know if people know what that is. Fre frequent, fre like frequently asked question, FAQ or? No, a fax is. A, oh, a fax, like a fax machine. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah okay. <laughs> so you get this like prehistoric paper. Yeah, it would come, come through like this machine with a phone and <laughs> you, it was kind of like an email before an email. Yeah, you yeah. You get a fax, yeah. It was a paper email. Yeah, that's exactly what it was, yeah. And, uh. It was on a crazy ass paper. Like I have some of the faxes from back then. And they it's look so crazy. crazy how they come into yeah with the yeah. noises and shit on yeah. the machine. So I'd get a fax and it'd say four interviews, an hour, an hour long. So you schedule a time with the guys when they want to do it. So give each person fifteen minutes. So I do the sound check, then we do press for an hour, then we do dinner, and then we do the show, and then we leave. So the for the four uh, interviews, it's 15 minutes each. So I had to, you know, be like, okay, cool, we're done. Next, you know, I'm bringing the next interview. Right. But I would, I would feel bad for the photographer because the interviewer would take up 10 minutes, you know, talking to these guys, right. which isn't that much time. It's not. If you think about it. If you think it. about it, yeah. But everybody knew the deal. So it was like, you know, you go and get this amount of time, the photographer, and I always see the photographer struggling, like, fuck, where am I going to shoot this classic picture of these four guys that are the hottest rappers yeah. in the world, and we're backstage at a concert for a four-page article. Right. And I would see them going like, fuck, man, poor guys, you know? But then I was, I was, I started feeling bad and being like, hey, if you guys need any photos of the guys backstage or on stage during the show, I have photos. 
And most of them would look at me like, yeah, you fucking yeah, sure get the you fuck do. out of here, yeah. you know, roadie or whatever the fuck you are. <clears throat> so then I had these little little books with my photos in them. They're like, you take these? And I go, yeah, that's why I'm telling you if you want to use my pictures, here, check them out. So then they started paying me to use my photos. In the magazines. Yeah, and I was like, oh, we'll give you $250, 500 bucks, you know, 1000 $1,500 for, to use the photos. Depending on the magazine and how big they would put it in there, so I was like, "Fuck, I could do this. Yeah. This is pretty nice cool. Side hustle. This yeah. is better than the other shit yeah. we were doing. Yeah, you know, the moving little things of weed or whatever. Right. You know, like right. this is cool. Right. So, um, I started getting a little bit more serious into that, and I was taking more pictures of my homies at the lowrider shit, more pictures of the touring stuff. And then I learned the, the the language with the magazines, and then I started learning about the videos and got into doing videos, and it took off, you know, slowly because I wasn't pushing it because I had a job. Because you were doing the other shit. Yeah. yeah. But in 2005, those guys were tired of touring, and they're like, hey, we want to take a little break. Is that cool? I'm like, yeah, you know, you guys are the, you're the boss, you know, like whatever you want to do. But they were getting money from music, but if you're not touring and you're, you're not tour crew, or, yeah, right, yeah, you're out. So they're like, "You good?" I go, "Yeah, yeah, I'm good." You know, like, what, what can I do? Um, so I just said, "Fuck it, I'm going all in with the, the photos, photos and directing." And uh, it worked out. I never had to go back out on tour again. What was uh, one of your early videos that kind of that you were able to direct that? Because cause, uh, directing a video back then, again, yeah, things are different now. Yeah, you can get a. Vi- I mean, anybody you can make you could literally shoot a video with an iPhone and it looked decent. You know, back yeah. then there was so much more that you would put into it. Oh yeah, a twenty thousand dollar video budget was nothing. That was like that's, disrespectful. That's a cheap video. Yeah, back then like, they're like disrespecting you, giving you twenty grand to shoot a video. So, what were some of your early videos that you were able to initially kind of be behind the lens and? Um, the I mean, I did videos with, for Mugs and B, their side projects, and then I would say the one that I did one for Sen. It was mm-hmm. called SX10. It was a, a ma- majority black and white video. Right. Back then, all the videos were shot on film. Right. So it was a whole process, and um, I showed that SX10 video to uh, Dennis from Interscope who works with Eminem and uh he was like I got a I got a D12 video for you and I was like okay cool and so I I remember getting all excited cuz it was going to be a $50,000 video budget you know right and it's for Eminem yeah it's and group, so man. I was like let's do that you know so I went to Detroit and shot uh it's called I'll shit on you I, I remember that song. And because they could never play it on, on the radio, radio or, or, well, they could never play it on the screen. Or BT or anywhere. MTV. M- yeah, yeah. it had a cuss word. And back then, there's no YouTube, really. Yeah, no. Right? So no, it wasn't like... Yeah, if you weren't on MTV or... or the box or whatever. The box well, it wasn't even the box back. I think it, by that by, by that time, it was BT and MTV by that time, yeah. I think the box was done. So if you weren't on there, you, you're asked You out. might end up on a DVD. Yeah, the, <laughs> the, the cussing uh, DVDs. Yeah, exactly. So... Um, but what I noticed was any time there would be a news story about Eminem, they would use the footage from my video because it was not seen. Right. And it was cool. It was black and white and it had yeah. him performing. So I would say that one probably hit the biggest right then. And also uh, Dr. Green Thumb <laughs> did, did uh, pretty big. And the challenge with that one was... Um, Here's a song all about weed, but you can't show weed or show that there's anything that has to do weed related. So right. I made up this like mad scientist. It was a dope video. Yeah. I remember that video as a kid. Right. Yeah. So it was like I made up a, this mad scientist idea, uh, and it was based off of uh, this old school movie. I can't remember the the name of the movie but there's a lot of you know touring and, that, and now it's a yeah <laughs> the mad scientist is a, is is all over dispensaries all yeah. Over yeah. merch weed bags yeah. everything 
So that video took off for me, and that that uh, sent me into another stratosphere. Yeah. yeah, and then I started. Uh, I met up with a a really good homie of mine uh, named Skinhead Rob. Shout out to Skinhead Rob. Uh, I loved him and Travis Barker and uh, the homie from the. Uh, Rancid. What, Rancid. That what was the name of that side for the transplants? transplants. That first transplants album was yeah. fucking raw. So he brought me in on that and I did the press photos and Yeah, then that fucking up, album was so good. We ended up doing uh the whole album packaging because mm. we had like a little art great, department. Great job. Yeah. And uh ended up doing two videos for them with the Booyah tribe. Yeah, and, I remember. Uh, yeah. Yo, fuck. Yeah. Dude, I got is that I gotta I haven't listened to that album in probably fifteen years. I gotta find it on Spotify. Yeah, because there was some shit on that album. So then Rob brought me in to that, and then he brought me into Blink One Eighty Two, and then did you do Expensive Taste stuff too with him and Paul? Yeah, Wall? yeah, yeah. There was Expensive Taste with Skinhead Rob and Paul Wall. That and was Travis fucking, and Travis. Yeah, yeah, fuck. That's a whole era of shit that I just forgot about. Yeah. That I was a fan of. That's crazy. Rob's been in like four or five bands and I did all the photos for all the bands. What was the band? It was... Was it just the Travis... Wasn't there a Travis Yellow Wolf album that w that was a group? Yeah. What was the name of that group? Uh, Fuck. I don't know if it was a group, but I just know It was that one they project did they did together. Yeah, with Half of the Faces. <laughs> mm -hmm. Damn. That's crazy. Shout out to Travis, man. He's a real one. Yeah. Then, so you were able to do some Blink stuff. Yeah, I did. Uh, my biggest video to date was uh, one called Down. Yes. And uh, I look at it now. Self-titled album. That was, a self, that was off the self-titled yeah. album. Yeah. Yeah. We did all the artwork for that. Mm -hmm. Did the merch. And uh, we did the video. I did uh, six videos off of that album. But um, wow. one was, uh, well, actually, I did seven, I think. Um one was down, and then I did uh, five videos that were on a CD-ROM only. Um, so it was like the deluxe album you bought? Right. You yeah. get to plug get to in, the, it in the computer. And you could play it as a DVD, too. <clears throat> and then I did uh, Not Now at the end of that, that tour that we were doing. That was a great album. Down's a great record. Yeah. So yeah. The, But the cool thing was with those guys, they were just like, do whatever the fuck you want to do. Like, I don't we trust care. you. And like for Down... I just had this idea that I wanted to do. I was like making a little movie. And, uh, you know, I had that little thing going on. Then I had the performance going on. And this one girl, like, you know, the net bangers and stuff, they go, What does this have to do with the song, what the song's about? And I was like, Oh, what a bitch. You know, like, fucking bitch talking shit about me. And then, uh, and then I was like, well, yeah, what what does it have to do with the song? Like, this has nothing to do with the song or anything. But I remember that the reason that it was like that was because they just said, do whatever you want. And I made up this little story that I wanted to make this. Basically, it's a guy who um, he's on, like, parole or... or mm -hmm or probation or whatever, and the cops come to this party, and he's like, fuck that. I'm not supposed to be here. I'm out of here. I'm out, yeah. He jumps the wall, hops in his ride, and takes off and gets into a police chase. And so that story's happening while they're, it's going back and forth to performance shots? Yeah. Yeah. It has nothing to do with the song. <laughs> yeah, but it's But just, to me, he's down. Yeah, he's down. That's all I was thinking. <laughs> was like, That's a down-ass fool right yeah, there. Yeah, that motherfucker's <laughs> down right here. So he makes it and he gets away, yeah. which never happens. Never. So I was like, I want to do that. So I did that, and that led to a, a film agent uh, named uh, Chris Smith. He was at this agency called Paradigm. He was like, hey, you need to do movies. And I was like, yeah, all right, cool. You know, like another Hollywood thing, like somebody telling me you should do this. Yeah, you've heard or, it a bunch. Yeah. How about let's do this or that? Right. So it was just another thing. I was like, yeah, yeah, okay. But he kept on me, and finally I gave in. I was like, all right, fuck it. So I go, what do you want to do? And then he just started introducing me to all these movie companies. And um, I had met Brian Grazer through uh, an art show that we did at uh, this Nike house in uh, Venice Beach. It was, the, it was called the Blue House. Nike had bought it, but it was the original house where Jim Morrison lived on the boardwalk. Mm. 
So I was like, man, this is cool. Like we're doing an art show in Jim Morris's old house, and right. we used to listen to the Doors and our Lowriders <coughs> right. all the mm-hmm. time. Like our Lowrider Club is the thing that was that we are known for was when we would pull into a car show, we're listening to Led Zeppelin, The Doors, right. or Jimi Hendrix, like classic rock, just blasting out right. of a car that's two inches off the ground going five miles an right. hour. It's crazy, you know, Black Sabbath. Like You put on, like, War Pigs or something yeah, like cause that. Yeah, because you would think, like, you know, the typical Lowrider Club was probably bumping, like, Zapp and Roger. And, you yeah, know, like some old some funk or soul. Some funky shit, yeah. Or, soul, uh, yeah. you know, some Marvin Gaye. Right, 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 right. Something like that. Or you're you're pull up, and crew. <laughs> bumping War Dog. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> War Pigs were yeah. just like, yeah. and you're just like, everybody's just like looking, what the fuck is that? That That's sounds fire. like evil, you know? Yeah. And then you just see the car just creeping, and it's like, yeah, it's a great feeling. But um, we did that that show. We met uh, Brian Grazer there. By the way, Brian Grazer, great Instagram follow. If anybody doesn't follow him, he's funny. Yeah, he's hilarious. Yeah. And uh, you know Ron Howard, which was cool. Like we got to meet uh, Richie Richie Cunningham from Happy Days, and. At that time, who wasn't a fan of Richie Cunningham? Sure. If you grew up in my era and you didn't watch Happy Days, there's something wrong with you. For sure. I watched it. I didn't grow up in your era, but I saw the reruns. That was my dad's so shit. To, yeah, so to be able to like work with Richie Cunningham, like, come on, man. For sure. You made it, you know? Yeah. So I got to uh, meet those guys, and they ended up... Uh, we had a documentary we were trying to put out called Ink, mm-hmm. and... Uh, they're like, we love the documentary, but we don't want to do it. We want to do a movie. So we're like, okay, cool. So they go, for seven years, you, uh, we, we're going to sign this deal with you, a three-movie deal. So for these next seven years, we, we want to do three movies with you. <clears throat> the first one, it was like seven years of rewrites on the script. It was like one rewrite a year for seven years. So by the seven years is over, we still didn't have a movie they're like, hey, thank you, man. The deal's gone. That was. Did fun. you still get paid? Uh, no, because you no. don't get paid till the till you do the the yeah, movie. Yeah, I'm, I'm not hip to the film game. The, like you know, in hip hop, they're giving advance, right? <laughs> you know, so I didn't. They know gave they us like a, a thirty grand right, advance for yeah, seven yeah. years. You Got, know? Yeah, which so is nothing. Yeah. Yeah, divide that up. And, uh, so, yeah. The writer got paid every every time he turned of in a course. script. So there were seven of those. He made you know his money. And then at the time, uh, the the people at Universal they didn't understand like Chicano culture right. or low ride or anything. They're like, we don't know, we don't know where to, how to do it. But we don't we don't get it. So that deal went away, and Brian kept pushing that he wanted to do the low rider culture. So we're like, well, that's cool, you know. He was like, hey, you know, the deal's over. You know, sorry about that, guys, but I still want to do a movie with you guys, and I'm gonna take control of it and try and push it this other direction and let's see what see what happens so we end up going from a 25 million dollar movie to a five million dollar movie and uh bloom house put it out and it's called low riders and it went to the theaters and did you know it did this little thing in there and for people don't know bloom house is known for they're probably known for their horror movies, right? Right. They got huge horror franchises. Yeah, they're the biggest, probably. Yeah. Hey, we got to give a shout out, man, before we keep going with this interview. Much love to the homies at My Bookie. Don't forget, it's NBA season right now, man. We already got through that NFL season. If you want to win some money, make sure you go to mybookie.ag, sign up with that promo code bootleg, get that first deposit bonus up to $1,000 right now. We can get in on some of this NBA action. Um, the MVP race is wide open right now. I kind of like Shea Gillis Alexander as the sleeper. You know, I think he's second favorite. I think he's going to win over Jokic, all right? Plus, you can get in on the rookie of the year. You can get in on your daily games. And they got the full service casino going down. Mybookie.ag. Use the promo code bootleg right now. Get in on the action. Let's make some money, all right? Go do that. Also want to give a shout out to the homies over at Blue Chew. Mm. Man, does Blue Chew work, they ask? Of course. What is Blue Chew, you ask? It is the same active ingredient as Viagra and Cialis, but in a chewable form. The best part about Blue Chew is it gets delivered right to your doorstep discreetly, and nothing involves you 
leaving your house and having to go to a doctor, sit down in the waiting room, so you can go talk to some strange old man about your problems that you have, maybe with erectile dysfunction, maybe stress, maybe performance, maybe you're tired of fucking your wife. Can you get tired of fucking your wife? I, I mean, I don't know. I'm not tired of fucking my wife, but maybe out there you're tired of fucking your wife and you need a little extra motivation to get that dick hard. Well, Blue Chew comes huh, in handy, my boy. So go to Blue Chew right now and um, they're going to give you a month supply for free. That's right. A month supply for free at BlueChew.com. The keyword, though, when you check out to get that month supply, help out the podcast. Use the keyword bootleg. That's BlueChew.com keyword bootleg. Get a month supply free of Blue Chew. Let's get back to the interview and such. It's interesting. Do you feel like, um, you know, I feel like the wave in hip hop is turning. Um, and I feel like, you know, when I was growing up outside of Cypress Hill and, you know, a few others. Um, but I grew up in Phoenix, so Chicano rap was really big, right? So like Little Rob and like Mr. Capone and uh, MC Magic and MB Riders and all those guys. And it was very, um, if you weren't, like Cypress Hill, everybody could enjoy. Yeah. They were, they just happened to be Latino, right? Yeah. The, but then there was that way where it was almost like if you weren't really connected to the Chicano culture, didn't understand it, you might not appreciate the music like the people who did appreciate the music. Right now, I feel like, man, there's this this Mexican wave in hip hop specifically is is rivaling anything we've ever seen. Um, you know, there's a guy like that Mexican OT who's going crazy. Uh, the L.A. and San Diego scene of Mexican rappers are just killing it. Like it's it feels like all of the major labels are now trying to sign Mexican talent, which yeah. I've never seen. I've never seen it. Yeah. I, Cause I'll hear people like a lot of my homies like there's a, have you heard of a group called Coyote? Yeah. Two brothers. Yeah. They're amazing. Uh, they put a record out with Shaq not too long ago, but like everyone's trying to sign them, you know. And any of my Mexican rapper homies, everyone's trying to sign. Like it's crazy. Like and I feel like like your movie might yeah. have been like before it's time. We are all we've been before it's time with everything we've done for sure. And. uh you know, even with the clothing, we had Joker clothing mm -hmm. back in '95. But me and Big Lucky, we had a store on Melrose called Supermax. Then we um, is that wait is that the same? Is Big that's not Big Lucky works with cookies, is it? Yep. Oh, that's my guy, man. That's my guy. He's a, he's the coolest yeah, motherfucker, yeah. man. Yep. He's such a cool dude. I'm bro. going to meet him right now. He's so cool, man. And right after this, I'm yeah, going to meet him. Yeah, shout out to him, bro. He's killing it, man. Yeah, I like that guy. We're getting you know more movie stuff. Yeah. Um, I gotta go on his podcast. We keep talking about. It. I gotta. I gotta make it over there, man. Yeah, Great guy. Yeah, it's gonna be. Everything's about to, to turn right now. Everything's about for you know bigger and better things. So, um, where were we? We oh, were. The, we were talking about the. So the movie got made by Bloom House. Little Riders came right. out, and then I got my footage back from the Ink documentary, mm -hmm. and we met a guy named Sebastian Ortega. He came here to work with these. Uh, he came here from Argentina to work with these other Argentinians, and his thing was, "I'll work with you, but I want to meet Esteban and Cartoon." So I went to meet him, and uh, he was like, "I want to do. I want to do the Ink documentary. What's up with that?" And I go, "That's funny you ask, because I just got the footage back. It had been ten years, right? Locked up, you right. know, uh, shelved. So I just got the footage back, and." Um, he goes, can we do it? I go, well, you know, it sounds good, you know, but what 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 are we talking about here? He goes, well, let me fly you to Argentina and uh, show you my my facility and see what you think. And he's like, you know, I'm the perfect guy to do this with. And and I'm like, looking at him like, okay, he's covered in tattoos from the neck down. He's wearing chucks. Dickies t shirt from Argentina, from Argentina, yeah. and he goes, Check this out. He shows me on his phone, he has two low riders. He's the only guy in Argentina with, with a low rider, right? And he has two of them. So I'm looking at him, he's going, Yeah, I'm the you know, I'm probably the perfect guy to do this with. I go, Yeah, I think you are. You know, in my head, I'm thinking, yeah. like, out of everybody, you obviously like, understand the culture, yeah, you, you get live it. it, yeah. And he goes, You know, I, I got into this business because of watching you guys and. 
I was like, oh man, that's cool. You know, you you guys inspired me. Shoots me a first class ticket, fly down to Argentina, picks me up, goes, we're gonna go to my facility. And I'm thinking like, you know, our office was crazy. We had like twenty low riders in mm. there. It was three warehouses downtown. It was downtown the in LA the gun yeah. club. It was like, you know, we had our offices in there, tattoos. Was this studio. the uh this was in uh Skid Row? Like yeah. near Skid Row, yeah, yeah. Yeah, SA Studios, we yeah. called it. Soul Assassin Studios. And then uh so I get there and I see this huge studio, like a film production studio, not like a studio. Like this is no, like, like the you real could shoot deal. Fucking shows, movies, you could shoot like everything fucking, yeah. in there, like some shit you drive by in Burbank. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, Burbank or Paramount yeah, or for sure, yeah. Sony. I was like, what the fuck? And he goes, what do you think, man? And as we're walking through that, Mister Ortega, you want a coffee, Mister Ortega? Did you eat today? You know, like they're just like. Loving him, and he's he's the 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 main guy there, the owner of it all. And I was like, man. And then he takes me to his pad and out in the country in Argentina, where he has his lolos, and we go cruising the lowrides. I was like, man, this is fucking sick. Fuck, like this is a <laughs> yeah. no brainer. Yeah. We're doing this shit. So he has like the number one show in in Argentina on on Netflix, and we do like a little cut and show them. And they like it, and then he's they gave us more money because he put in a, a pretty good chunk. Right. <clears throat> and uh, they liked it so much, they were like, they showed Netflix. I guess it's like Latino Netflix. Yeah, for South, I mean, South if you America. go to, depending on where you are in the world, if you turn Netflix on, shit's different. <laughs> yeah, way different. Yeah, yeah. So this is like Argentina Netflix. Right. He, they showed it to the main headquarters over here. And they're like, let's go. So they gave us the rest of the money to finish it, and then it was we changed the name to LA Originals, which came out fire. Yeah, so such a great fucking you guys killed that shit, dude. Yeah, it, man, I was, I was proud of that one. And then then the pandemic came. We were supposed to go to South by Southwest Film Festival. Mm -hmm. We were the headliners, the main pick there. A week before they canceled it for the pandemic yeah. and the COVID, you know. So yeah. everybody's like, "Hey, homes, what do I do?" We had like thirty homies going with us. What do I do? You know, I got my got fucking my ticket plane the ticket, the hotel, yeah. Airbnb. Like, how am I gonna get that? I go, homie, I don't know. Like, what, go out there what, and hang out. And what do I look like? Yeah. You know, like <clears throat> flights were canceled, yeah. everything. So you know, the airlines, everybody gave their yeah, yeah they their were giving hell. Back. Everybody was getting refunds during that time. But it was kind of you yeah. know scary. Like, yeah, for sure, it was unknown. We never, yeah. There's mm -hmm. that pandemic. Then you don't know if you're gonna get your money back. Right, it right, just right, looked right, like. Luckily, at that that week, everybody was locked down. They were in home, and they just. I remember I was to supposed to go to the. TV. I was supposed to go to South by that year. Yeah, and I was like, well, I guess that ain't happening. Yeah, <laughs> so everybody turned the, the channel on, and there, there, we everybody were. was just at home watching yeah. fucking the news, <laughs> fucking e <laughs> scared to go to the grocery store. Yeah, <laughs> I remember I was, I had to go to Seven Eleven. I fucking put gloves on and shit. I was like, oh man, I don't know, baby. We yeah. really need. <laughs> that shit was crazy. Yeah, it was crazy, and it was funny. Like now that we like look back and like realize like. We oh, probably overreacted, you know. Like, oh yeah, was well, fucking. We didn't know, you know. We didn't know. We didn't, we didn't know. It was the first time it ever happened. Yeah, that shit was out. Safe and sorry. Hey, I want to ask you. Um, you know, for people who don't know, when you land in L.A. and you go to the airport in the gift shops, one of the most ripped off. I know that in the gift shops, the L.A. is officially yours. Yeah, but in general, right. Your iconic image of those tattooed hands, yeah, is probably the most pirated, ripped off Design. photo in hip hop culture yeah. ever. And it's the most tattooed. And it's the most tattooed. But when I tell you, man, I see that shit everywhere. Yeah, and it and it's crazy, right? So it's like yeah. for you, it's like uh, the double edged sword. Can you tell me the story behind that specific photo? Yeah, I was out in downtown, and I was doing a, a little photo shoot that I was doing for my clothes. And uh, I was shooting a, a woman, you know, gang member, mm -hmm. and she was throwing up her neighborhood. And I was like, hey, can you throw up something, you know, more universal so that 
like you know, I we didn't want to be branded to just one neighborhood right. and the picture come out right. and like yeah, it says the name of the brand, but the photo, uh, you know, she's throwing up her hood. It could be it any could, hood, you know. Yeah. But with that letter, you know, mm-hmm. so it's like let's um, let's do something more universal, you know. Let's let's throw up the L.A. and she did it, and I was like, usually back then i didn't really know anything about photography this 1994 you know i'm telling mm-hmm. you i got my camera like a year before probably so i'm just shooting like from afar you know like like maybe 10 feet so you could see the whole building and everything and i wasn't really into shooting details but for this one time like two shots i went in and i just shot the fingers you know mm. just, just the hands and um I didn't really put it out there like that for for a little while, maybe a couple of years, because I was more into the whole environment, like the the whole photo. Right. <clears throat> so um, when people would ask me for, I would do an interview or whatever, they would say, "Can you send us ten of your best photos that you like the most?" And I would, I was noticing that I was shooting just wide full frame shots, like a. A girl with a house, or a guy with a house with a low rise. Yeah, a lot of your photos are like storytelling for real. Yeah. So I wanted to change it up, and I wanted to show some detail shots, like just the rim, or just the fingers, or just the face. You know, and um, I started sending that around and seeing the reaction that it was getting. I was like, "Fuck, I'm gonna send it again," you know. And I just kept sending that on every one. I would change maybe the other nine photos out of the ten they wanted. I would change those other ones, but I always send the LA fingers, and people would always print that one. You know, they'd say like, "Send ten, and we'll pick four or five or whatever." That, that would be the one that Everyone. always got printed. Yeah, the either it was the main part <clears throat> of the story with mm-hmm. my, you know, uh, LA photographer. You know, boom, there's that photo. Then the interview. Or they want it for the cover or whatever, and uh, I noticed that she was just the one. Yeah. So I just kept putting it out there here and there for thirty years. I've been putting it out there. You kind of said it's like a gift and a curse, right? Because it is such an iconic photo, but it's also, like you said, I mean, like if you walk through Santee Alley, yeah, you're gonna probably see your shit. <laughs> oh, for sure, <laughs> everywhere. Venice Beach, Santee yeah. Alley, everywhere. You see your yeah. shit. You're like, that's my shit. Yeah. But you also, if you go to LAX, there's the official shit. Right. You know, so that's what I'm trying to do is get the official shit out there enough to where people don't have to buy the bootleg shit from right. the scumbags down there, you know, yeah. doing the fake shit. No, no, how- no disrespect to the name bootleg, but no, it's all good. You know, um, <laughs> The bootleg a, shit. Yeah, yeah. Those guys, you know, it's like that's my that's my shit. You know, like I've been promoting that that photo that I took for thirty years, and you just fucking go and make a shirt of it, you know, and cash in on my hard work. You know, yeah. it's that's a fucked up feeling. It sucks too because I do feel like that's kind of the plight of photographers is somehow, you know, you've obviously been able to break through and, and be one of the goats, but like somehow photographers, man. And even videographers and graphic designers. I feel like those three, but, but photographers moreover than anybody, somehow always, man, just, just don't get the appreciation. Because I feel like people who don't know, they don't really understand, like, the work. Right. The, like, like you said, you were, you were on tour with people, and you guys might have been standing right next to each other. And you would see their photos. And you'd be like, how the fuck right. did you get that? And I got mine, and we're standing inches from right. each other. Right. This is not, like... You know, there's just so much that goes into it and like, you know, no one thinks about the photographer when they print a, sh- print a, t- a picture. And yeah. On. I mean, it happened with Cameron. Cameron was selling merch of the picture of him on the uh, phone wearing all pink and didn't credit the photographer and the photographer sued him and won. Yeah. You know, and it's like, you got to understand, like, that's art. Like, that's right. your art. You're the artist. Yeah, it's like you taking one of their songs and just putting exactly. it on your and shit. And they're going to want to get paid. Oh, they get hot. They yeah, get, it's going to get hot. Hey, motherfucker, you can't use my song. Exactly. Like, well, don't use not? my fucking photo. Yeah, yeah. It's that simple, but everything's just so twisted now. It's, like, so crazy, like, that whole thing, you know? It's yeah. Like, but, I mean, I'm sure that that photo has been such a blessing for you yeah. as well. 
Yeah, because every time they use it without asking, it's cease and desist. Blessings. You must have a great fucking lawyer. <laughs> yeah, the cease and desist doesn't isn't that great because you're just telling people to stop, stop. doing yeah, yeah. what you already been doing. That's the, the lawsuit. That's the helpful. better one is like at the end of they made all that money, and then you're like, hey, did any of the big? Because I always see like Fashion Nova, Sheen, some of these like uh, bigger. Companies that are like manufactured in China, did they ever steal your shit? Yeah, they they got to pay too. So they did, don't get. Did, so you sued them. They get they they got to cut a check. Yeah, you know. So who 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 took who who was one of the bigger brands? They don't you, let me say it. Oh, okay, got it. Got you it. know that's part the, of it, but right. but they had to cut a yeah, motherfuckers yeah. had to cut a check. Yeah, I got my residuals or what do they call in the music industry when you residuals? Get, your oh your uh, royalties. Yeah, I had to get my royalties. That's great. We're on hip hop shows. Yeah, man. of course. I had to get my royalties. That's dope, man. I I, I I think it's just so cool every time I, I'm at LAX and I see your shit. And then my homie Franco does your merch. Yeah. In Burbank. So yep. I'll be in, I'll be at the factory and I'll see all your shit. Yeah. So my my boy Mike Messix, who is next door to him. Mm-hmm. Uh I the don't barber know if shop? you know him. No, he was next door to the building next door. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Got you, got you, and got you. He took me over there. Milky Way, yeah. yeah great place. Mike yeah. Messix was one of my Old fr- oldest friends in like Hollywood, mm-hmm. he was one of the first guys to do raves, and he DJ'd and he did the clubs, and he was one of the guys that I used to work the door with, That's door crazy. four, and um, then he got me into DJing and stuff. So we'd go to DJ like fraternity parties and weddings and quinceañeras and bar mitzvahs and all that. So. He was like big in the LA scene back in the days with like delicious vinyl and yeah. all that. Like he was around the times of all that and one of the bigger DJs of all those right. parties. You uh you do a lot like like you know when when you do street photography like you've done, it could probably result in you being in some like dangerous situations. Yeah. You've done a lot of dope shit with gang members and skid row, like um I want you to kind of like what's like one of the more sketchy situations you found yourself in? Um, just rolling around Skid Row. Sometimes there's you and know, this is like old school Skid Row. Yeah, this is a the new school Skid Row. Yeah, is, is what I don't know which one's worse. Now, now for now sure, it's a thousand times worse. Because you drive through Skid Row, there's just fires in the middle of the street and shit. And That's nothing. They, they they all got guns, you know. Like there's fools down there with guns, like. <sighs> I don't know how they get them because they can barely afford the next fucking. Because I remember from the LA Originals documentary, like you had like a pre, you have good, like you guys were there, so you had good relationships with. Yeah, yeah, we're we're the, cool with all them down there, right? You know, like we've we become, you know, we you have to adapt to where you are, you know. So if you're moving into back then, it was a Skid Row. Where we were was an extension of Skid Row. Right now, it's called the Artist District. They put everybody more in a compact area, but uh, back then, you know, they were, they'd break into our cars like every day, and and sometimes we'd catch them and and uh, you know explain to them this isn't the right thing to do, and uh, they P- got politely. Yeah, yeah. They got the message, and then uh, we made friends with some of the ones who we see every day. You're like, hey, We're look like, out for our shit. Yeah. Yeah. And we'll look out for you. So we'd give them, like, clothes, food, food whatever, you know, yeah. break them off Maybe a little money here and there. And then, yeah. Yeah. And so then uh, we became really tight with with a guy named Pepper. Mm-hmm. He, he, they, he called himself the mayor of Skid Row. He was, like, one of the only white guys down there. And he told me that he got his name Pepper from, he got jumped, and that he got a hold of some pepper spray and went back and, you know, gave him a little issue of the pepper spray when they were sleeping in right. the tents and stuff. So that's, he got his nickname. But uh, he was uh, cool as fuck, you know? Right. He'd always look out for us, and, and he had the respect of all the guys down there, so he would just be like, hey, these are the homies, you know? If you guys want to break into cars, just don't break into these ones. Yeah. And everybody, from then on, everything went cool and smooth. And so we'd hire him for, like, if we'd have an event, 
we would hire him and a couple other guys to just be like, hey, you guys be over here on the outskirts. Yeah, make sure and, none of the bullshit gets over here. Right. Right. And they would. And they were so cool. And like, and, and they would tell those guys, like, hey, these guys are the homies. So at 11 o'clock when it ends, you guys can come back and we would give them, the, you know, all the food. Yeah, and whatever left over from catering, whatever. Yeah, come through. Yeah. Drinks, whatever. Yeah. So we just would look out for them like that. And then we started doing little things like... um you know, we'd go buy like a couple hundred hamburgers, mm. you know, from McDonald's or Farmer Brothers down yeah, there. Just take care of everybody. A couple hundred burritos. Like, right. And then we just started getting into that whole thing of giving back to the community. This is back then, you right, know. Right, right, so, right, right. And that felt good. It felt great to like, you're in somewhere and there, you see the struggle every day. You're a part you're, of the community you're too in now. in the middle of it, right. you know. You have no choice. So it was a good feeling for us to give back, you know, on a on a regular basis, not on Thanksgiving or Christmas. Just which on is, a, yeah, which is which what everybody, everybody does. does. Yeah, you know, like you go down there on Skid Row now. There's like 50 vans, people giving out food to where the guys are rolling around with like four uh, to go trays right. full of food. And it's like, what are they gonna do with that? Yeah, they don't have a refrigerator. Yeah, that, a lot of that shit's going bad. Yeah, it's going to going bad in two days. You yeah, know, or the rats are going to get it. Mm-hmm. So we would do it on all the off days. You know, like on a normal day. Yeah, like just it's Monday. Come yeah, here. it's Monday. It's freezing. You know, and this is pre fentanyl. Obviously, this is oh, this is pre everything. Pre everything. Twenty years ago. Twenty five. When... Thirty years ago. Yeah. So uh, we got into that whole thing, and you know, taking uh, we we we. We used to take our lowriders down there and take like two cars of lowriders and two cars of the food and stuff, just to try to give them like a you know make them feel good, right, right, see right. Some cool see shit. some cool shit, yeah, eat, feel hang like, out, yeah. Like, you know, everybody, every one of them had an uncle or their dad or whatever had a lowrider. You know, back in the day, right. so they're like, oh yeah, my dad used to have one of these, blah blah. You chop it up and you know they uplift their spirit over there for sure. I mean, you're down there every day. You're you you you, it, you could get psyched out. Yeah, like the the depressed. The yeah, the negativity and just a dark. You know, being in the dark place all the time, twenty four seven, can't be you know good for you. You know, it's just like the the perfect uh, remedy for mental health. I got more questions, but I have to take a piss. So let's take a quick piss. Go break. for it. Piss break. Hey, we got to stop the interview to tell you about our good folks at. Odd Socks. That's right. We love Odd Socks, man. This is our family right here. Naruto, uh, Street Fighter. I can't wait because they're about to send us the new Office Odd Socks. Um, they just did the Office uh, collab for the TV show The Office, so that's just fire. I can't wait till we get those in to show y'all. You can check them out, oddsocksofficial.com. They got the draws, Dr. Pepper underwear, Hot Cheetos, man. You know what I'm saying? Shout out to everybody whose dick smells like Hot Cheetos. Fucking take a shower. With that being said, oddsocksofficial.com. Use the promo code bootleg right now. Save 20% off at checkout. Also, want to give a shout out to our family at King Palm. Now, we've been smoking on these King Palms for almost a year now, man. Let me tell you, bro, it kind of changed the way I look at smoking because this is a natural tobacco-free leaf. It's organic, baby. What's great about it is it's got the terpenes that uh, is going to get you right with the flavors. Like these right here. This is the peach pineapple. I do love the peach pineapple. I also love the apple, the regular apple. I also love the lemon haze. Uh, I also love, give me a, give me a, oh, give me the banana creams right there. Look, these are them boys right here. Woo, the banana creams. They're fire, all right? So this was dope. King Palm, whatever city you're in, man, pull up to the smoke shop. They're going to have King Palms for you. 7-Eleven, they're going to have King Palms for you. Or you could just use the promo code bootleg uh, right now at kingpalm.com, and you're going to get 50% off. Half off, fifty percent off, and they got cool devices. Hand me a cool device uh, over here. Uh, more down, down. There's better devices. Kingpalm.com. Promo code bootleg. Fifty percent off whatever's on the website. For example, cool device. This is an electronic grinder, so you could grind up your your flour. You know what I'm saying? They got all kinds of shit. Kingpalm.com. Promo code bootleg. And uh, let's get back to the interview. Like good. All right. Tear that one up. We're back. Yeah. Can we shift the box? Oh, sorry. You can see it? Yeah. You can see all the way over here? Or the wide angle can. Oh, okay. just the wide angle. That's good. Right. Uh, are we back? 
All right. So we were talking about you on Skid Row. I was curious because sometimes as an interviewer, there'll be stuff that gets talked about on my shit that I'll know I won't put out. Because were there ever any photos that you got any flack for releasing or no. any backlash or just with the politics? I, you know, you, you never know. Um, no, one girl tried to come at me for a photo that was in the the thing because she said it was like defamation in her or whatever. I was like, come on, man. I looked at her, her Instagram or Facebook. I'm like, sweetheart, your, your Instagram's worse than this photo. <laughs> yeah, this photo is like blessing you. Yeah. You know? And you were, you were uh, it's 20 years old, so you look a little bit better than that. So come on, man. Yeah. Like, <clears throat> just take, take, Take that one, you know. You what got if, you got a good photo of me when you were in your prime for free, and now you're frame it in, and put it in your living room. Right now yeah. you're not in your prime. You're far from it, and you're. I don't know what the fuck you think I'm ruining about your image. Like, look at your page. You know? Right, 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 right. For but you, that was about it. You know, like the rest. Everybody loves. All the photos I've done of them or their family members. I was going to say, when you meet a guy like Baldacci, that guy's like made for your camera. Right. <laughs> like you guys, Bald, Bald, for people who don't know, Baldacci's a, a rapper. He's a, a really nice guy. Sweet dude. I've had him on the inter- I mean, he's not a sweet guy. He's a s- nice guy. Yeah. He's definitely not sweet. Uh, serious guy, but very talented dude. Um, very nice guy. He's a rapper from L.A., but he's also, his Instagram is the face of L.A. because his entire face is Yeah, is tattooed. blasted, yeah. So when you meet a guy like that, are you like, yo, we got we to gotta take some pics? Yeah, so sometimes, you know, sometimes you can see how they are, and they yeah. might be on a sick one, you know? So you're like, uh, yeah, I'm cool, you know? Like, you don't want this dude calling you every day or, like, you know... Like, yo, what's up hey, with those photos? Uh, yeah, well, then once it's a photo, it's like, hey, so what's up with the next thing? And, you know, like, on you, you know? So you meet somebody like Baldacci, who's like, he's, you know, all covered in tattoos and everything, but he's all about the business. He's a very, yeah. very just buttoned up dude. Yeah, like, super respectful. He was raised the right way mm-hmm. by, you know, the right people in, in, in that world and... He's a stand-up guy, you know, all the way around. So when you meet guys like that, you're like, "This is this is cool," you know. Like, you're uh, obviously uh, there's the the exhibit that's at the is, is the Hip Hop to Infinity, yeah, which is uh, Mass Appeals putting on. How, how what how much of your work is on display there? Um, me me and Mass Appeal go back to the magazine. Before Nas owned Mass Appeal, right? It was a mag. It was like almost like an underground magazine that like yeah. certain little record stores would have. Yeah, it was dope a, photos, high quality, right? High it integrity. Was, yeah, it was badass that magazine. Um, Even the paper was like yeah. different. The cover was like a different type. Yeah, of feel. it was high high end. Yeah. like you say, you know, it wasn't like these cheap magazines. Right, it was dope. And then um, uh, I had a a section in there called Rides and Rims. Mm-hmm. It was a two-page section, and we'd feature cars in there, like car culture, because they, they didn't want it to be too much East Coast, so they wanted to spread it out, you know, throughout the States and L.A., New York, the right. Bay, you know. Cause it was a very East Coast yeah. publication, for sure, yeah. So we ended up uh, having those two pages in there, and... um Ended up doing other features for them. I shot a cover of Eminem and Rakim for them and uh, a couple, you know, different spreads, you know, mixed throughout the years that I worked with them. And then it came to, I did a documentary, uh, like some consulting on the L.A. riots with them. And uh, the next documentary I did with them was called um, Insane in the Brain. It was a documentary about Cypress Hill. That's the one on Showtime. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, that that was like, you know. That was what, a year ago? A year and a half ago? Uh, 2022, yeah, I think. Yeah, a couple years ago. Yeah, so that was like uh, another perfect movie for me to follow up with L.A. Originals. And um, 
the next thing was this art show and they they've been doing it around the world and other places but this is the first time that's had this much of my work in it i have my own room uh towards the back and uh it said uh they they asked me put my elements of what hip-hop means to me so I did one wall of memorabilia that I have of me and Cypress Hill, like the jerseys and the clothes we used to take and the gold and platinum records and the dat tapes from right. the shows and different things like that. And then I did a wall of Nipsey Hussle. Uh, my friend Downtown Daniel did a mural. And never, uh, 1959, he, already, he also did a mural of Nipsey. But um, the one of Downtown Daniel has the actual reference picture that he would look at and test the colors on that and then he'd do the mural on the wall downtown off fourth and alameda so i have the original photo uh, the reference picture and then i have a photo of him doing it and then i have his first painting that he's ever done for like galleries and that's it's all the same image of nipsey and then i uh, have my bike in there and on another wall, I have low riding, like memorabilia from all the years I've been low riding. And the other wall is like a gangster wall because to me, what sets LA hip hop aside from other cities is low riding. There's a lot of always a lot of low riders in our videos and our imagery. Mm -hmm. And there's the gangster element. Yeah, the gang culture is starting with NWA, you yeah. know. So on that wall, I have um, letters and uh, envelopes and and handkerchiefs. They call them paños. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> that my homies Big Lucky and, and Lepke would send me. <clears throat> so you can see all that prison artwork. Then I have the original tattoo that I, machine that I made for a uh, cartoon. He tattooed me. The very first carto uh, cartoon tats in a box with uh, some Tupperware cups that were sent to me from prison. And then on the s side of that, there's um, a whole wall of Teen Angel magazines, which was an old gangster magazine that you could pretty much only find in la or the bay wow and uh it's it you know it's it's in sneak now or what do they call it out of print then yeah it's yeah. out of print. Out of circulation yeah. and then a teen angel died some years back so but uh i have a show coming up with teen angel at beyond the streets in june oh, so fine. that's gonna be a good what was one. like for you like uh you know was nip i mean Obviously, Nipsey was from a different generation than you in terms of just like his come up, but you know his impact was so crazy. How did he kind of like how, like like what was your uh, what was it about Nipsey that you respected, enjoyed? You know, um, just how he carried himself. Yeah, you know he was real respectful, uh, real calm, and like mellow and smooth. But you could tell he was with the business, you know, like at any moment or something, you know, went went sideways, you know, he would he would get your back or he wouldn't let it happen, you know. So he also had like a high risk. He had to have a high respect for photographers because his manager was Jorge Peniche. Yeah. Who is also a dope photographer yeah. and a dope logo guy yeah created the all money in logo and the tmc yep. logo so he i feel like nipsey had like a real high regard for dope photography yeah he did um <clears throat> those the photos that i did for him was mm -hmm. for an old magazine called rhyme magazine it was I, a mm -hmm. la uh, hip-hop magazine and um at that time i had the kind of relationship with magazines where they would say, what do you want to do? And I would say, you know, I want to do a story on this guy, this guy, this guy. And they didn't even know who they were. But I would still... They would trust you to yeah. curate. So at that time, uh, J-Rock's album hadn't come out. Nipsey's album hadn't come out. Um, and uh, who else was there? I shot uh, some early pictures of Kendrick because he was with J-Rock yeah. when I did his photos. 
and there was a uh, one more guy that I was I was always pushing to magazines that the new the new class and, of the LA guy. Yeah, I just wanted to show like the here comes a new wave of LA guys. And I I didn't only have connections here in LA, but I had or New York in the states. I had uh, foreign connections like right. in Germany, hip hop's huge over there, Australia, just different places where I had. Uh, a relationship with the magazine that I could do stories on these mm -hmm. guys and send it over to them and it would come out and you know a lot of that would uh, help the artists out you for know, sure to get expand into there. a new place yeah so there was a a lot of that happening back then uh, I, sh I got to shoot Nipsey a couple times for a couple different things before he had ever come out with a, a record right. on a label and then uh, I think that that deal that we were going to do made it to where he was like, I'm not even going to do stuff with a label no more. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just go independent. Yeah, he was doing the mixtape shit. Yeah. Left Epic. Um, yeah, Nip was like a one of one, man. Yeah. So, But I had a big plan for him that we were going to do. At that time, uh, one of my best friends, Casey, from Known Gallery, had a gallery. I was already doing stuff with Nick Diamond, so my my idea was, let's do your like an album cover photo shoot, and then we do an art exhibit at the at the gallery right. on Fairfax, and then we do a, a clothing capsule release with Diamond, and that would be the the listening party for the album. Is That's you crazy, know, yeah. The album would be playing in the gallery where all the photos from the whole A Day in the Life of Nipsey would yep. be on display. And then the clothing capsule, people could go in and buy merch, and um, the album would be playing in there. And that wasn't thought of back then. Right. You know, this is 2008, I think. Crazy. So, you know, then the the deal didn't go with the label, and then he went on and just started putting stuff out on his own. Mm -hmm. So we never got to do that. Did the plan. proud to pay tape, you know, or you know, obviously that first Crenshaw mixtape in which he yeah kind of set up a blueprint that a lot of artists have been following since. Yep. So shout out to Nip. You, uh, we and you have a mutual friend, uh, our boy Richie, and he was telling me that you you do the cold plunge and you do the you do the cold hot therapy. Yes. Can you? Uh, I, because for people who don't know the benefits of that, why do you do it? How, like, what are the benefits? What's you know? Um, and is that something you do every day? Every day. And it's um, <clears throat> we have a couple. I have a couple guys come over, uh, who got me into the the sauna and cold plunge thing. Is a f friend of mine named Marlon. Uh, he used to have a brand called Sneak Tip. I remember Sneak Tip. Right. I used to have some of their T-shirts. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, another good friend of mine, uh, Pat from RVCA, which was Ruka. Yeah. And um, Pat would take me out to Hawaii during the Pipeline Masters every winter for 13 years to shoot all his, the people that he sponsored. It'd be like 20 of the top world fighters, 20 of the top world surfers, skaters, right. and street artists. He'd fly them all out there. Rent a few houses, put everybody up, and and you just take pics. And I would just take pics of the team. It's fire. And it's during the Pipeline Masters, which is those waves are crazy. One of the right? biggest surfing competitions yeah. in the world, the best, the coolest, funnest. Yeah. And uh, I was just documenting all that for a book. And uh, you know, I wasn't really into health or working out. I was eating like what people say, eating good. Mm -hmm. But really eating like shit, you know, just a lot of and a lot of it, you know. I was like two sixty five, you know, just getting fat and out of shape, and right. wasn't feeling good, you know. But everybody's telling you, "Oh, you're eating good, you're living that good life," but it's like really, you're not. You're, you're, eating, fucking, you're eating worse. You can't breathe because you right. fucking eat so much. You need a wheelchair to fucking take you out of the restaurant. Yeah, the food is good. That's why you're eating so much, but. It's not good for you. Right. So once a, once a year, I'd go out to the North Shore with Pat and them, and we'd work out every day and do the sauna and cold plunge, and I just got 
to the point where I was like, man, this is a shit, you know? Like, I want to do this back home. Right. So I bought me a, a little sauna off of the the website. They shipped it to my house. My boy, uh, he hooked it up. He built, like, a <clears> patio, <throat> put the sauna on there. Then we built, like, a little roof over it because we didn't want to mess it up. And we got a little, you know, cool little thing there. Got a bunch of weights. Started inviting some homies over, and we made a thing. And now, you know, we do it every day. And uh, I feel bad when I don't do it. I feel like, man, I, you know, I feel guilty. Like, like I fucked up that day. How how um how long did it, I mean? I, you probably never get used to the cold plunge thing, but how long did it take you to be able to tolerate it? The first time I had to because I I seen like because for people who don't know when you when you immerse your body in that cold water go into shock it it almost feels like your heart might jump out of your chest yeah like, it, it still feels like that but you know what's coming you know yeah and, like I, I uh, but imagine twenty like all tatted up ripped UFC fighters and world class surfers and they're all doing it they're all doing it and you're there. So you gotta. And, and everybody you, thinks like, oh, you're the cool guy from LA. Like right. you, you, you're not a pussy, right? No, no, hell no. Right. Well, go, go ahead and get in that fucking bucket full of ice. Then and you, you're like, when you huh. get in, man, that shit hits you like a ton of bricks. Yeah. You are. I, I, it's it's and but it, but it's also like, it's like a shot of dopamine. Yeah. It almost like. Better than any cup of coffee. Yeah, for sure. Better than uh, it feels incredible when you do it. When you get out, yeah, it's just it's rough. It is rough. It's yeah. not easy. It is rough. Like you, like I've I, you know, it's, it's, it's but it's it's so it's like a drug almost. Yeah, I I do it every day. I I've been taking a a hot because sh- I have the shower outside. I haven't taken a hot shower in my house for a few years. Wow. Ever since I started doing it, so I just you wake up in the I'm morning, cool hit the cold it. shower. Yeah, I love it. It's like a way to wake up, and you know, you don't die doing it. It's not nah, gonna kill you. But you get out of that shower, and you're fe- you feel alive. Yeah, you feel alive. You because you take charged. that hot shower in the morning. Yeah, and it doesn't. It makes you almost want to go back to bed. Yeah. It, yeah, it, you're just sitting in there. You're sitting like, there like, oh. you're like, yeah, like you know, I'll put some water in my eyes. Yeah, like. Pfft. Fuck all that. I just would get in there and like, Ugh, you know, like. Yeah, you just take it. Yeah, you just you're starting the day Dude, manning crazy. up, you know. For sure. But it's a great feeling, man. I, so you I, do it every day? Every day, yeah. Wow. How long you uh, sit in the sauna? Uh, at least 15 minutes up to 20 minutes, right. depending on if I have to go do something. And if people come late and you're waiting for them and, you know. How many folks do it with you every day? We have, uh, there's enough room in there for six people, but um, we've had up to 10, and you just rotate people. Like, you know, these guys go in, these guys go in the ice, these guys, you know, while these guys are in the ice, these guys are in the sauna, these guys are working out, hitting the weights. Is there anything, uh, obviously you said Joker Brand's barely just getting, you you guys are obviously still very much a a thing. Joker brand. I don't think a lot of people knew you were behind Joker brand. I didn't know that until I watched the. I feel like I, I found that out in the last few years. Yeah, because you'll see Joker brand everywhere. Yeah, I always been, thought it was be real shit. Me and be real started. Okay, okay, we, okay. we got it. I from, remember the like ads in the source and shit. Yeah, double XL back in the day. Yeah, that was me shooting be real. Mm-hmm. So, um, it, it was a uh, cartoon and and sucker Mike. Mm-hmm. These two friends back then they were in our our car club together. And they ended up doing Sucker Brand clothing. But as an offshoot, they did Joker. And it went to a couple of trade shows at the Magic, yes. a couple of Magic shows. Probably and, when Magic uh, was cracking. Right. So they ended up not wanting to do it no more. So they had all this inventory. I was coming out of this clothing brand I had, Not Guilty, with Lucky and Everlast. And this lady shut us down because she had a worldwide trademark we didn't know we we got it incorporated we thought like oh we got the, we own the llc yeah we, we own everything that yeah. says not guilty but like we didn't go to school or nothing we didn't know anything right. about business <clears throat> got this not guilty incorporated and this lady goes well that's great i have the not guilty trademark worldwide get the so fuck out luck. of here yeah. so that was over and then these guys had all this inventory and B-Roll was like, we should do something. I go, well, let's go get that inventory. It's already there. 
So we went and bought the inventory off of them and, and all the artwork and started just taking it on tour with us everywhere we went. And then every time I'd do a photo shoot, I'd bring a box like to Mob Deep or right. Fabulous or whoever and be like, hey, homies, you know, uh, thank you for, you know, having me do this shoot with you guys for this Here's magazine or whatever. Here's a box of our gear. And they'd be like, oh, fuck, can we wear it? And we're like, hell yeah. Like, you don't have to wear it for this. I'm not bringing it like, hey, here's my shirt. Put it, you know. Yeah. It's like, you could wear it later on when you get back to New York or whatever. But just as a respect thing, they wear it in the shoot and come out in the magazine and we're all over the place. And so That's dope. that just like blew up organically. Any uh, projects coming for you and that, that you got? Coming out, working on, I'm sure you're always working on something. Yeah, I'm working on a documentary with uh, the Booyah tribe because uh, I be feel fire. like, you know, that story needs to be told. It's I an agree. L.A. story. and I agree. If you know, you know, and if you don't, you should. Mm -hmm. So I'm um, uh, working with uh, Gotti and Cobra, the remaining brothers. Uh, That's a big story to tell. Godfather, uh, Rid, Monster O, rest in peace. Rest in peace. Passed That's away a big story the, to tell, man. Yeah. And it needs to be, you know, like. 100%. Those dudes, you know, were there from the beginning of L.A. hip hop. Mm -hmm. And, like, I just feel like that area, like the Carson area of L.A., I don't think people fully understand, you know, like the Pacific Islander or the Samoan or the Oos like culture that comes out of there and how it also can be wrapped into like the street side of things as well. It's almost yeah. like, you know, it's, it's, it's just, it's crazy because if it's, it's almost like a Booyah tribe is out right now active, like they were in the nineties and shit. Like, with the with the allure of gang culture nowadays on the internet is so fucking crazy. I don't get it, but yeah. it's like, but it's dope that you're doing that. Yeah, and then uh, Cobra's son D Boy, he he's <laughs> rapping now and he's bad. He's, oh, I didn't. Oh, that's dope. I gotta yeah, check him he's out. He's sick with it. That's he's, dope. So yeah, that, that oh shit. So that's that's gonna be dope. Yeah, he's bad. Do you have a home for that project? Uh, not yet. I'm We're sure. just getting uh, interviews together. I went with D-Boy to uh, New Zealand. They did a tribute to the Buya tribe out there at this festival. He performed, and then they a bunch of the older guys from that did music with them came out and did like a tribute show to them. So that was like some you know cool footage that you just can't get for any other group, right? You know, that's like, dope. That's super dope. And then so, I, I got the Joker and the Stevan Orioles and Zoomies now, so we're, you know. Go support at Zoomies? Yeah. Just you trying guys, to have it somewhere where, you know, the regular folks can get it. Have you guys done a collab with Cookies yet? Yeah, I did. You did do one with Yeah, Stevan right? Orioles. Yeah, I did. a. Uh, that was one of the things that kept me going in, uh, the, in the COVID because... I did a couple of collabs, like Fools Gone Wild, Cookies, mm -hmm. Cholo Fit Creeper, <clears throat> and Born and Raised. And um, those things are what kept me going during the pandemic, COVID, because yeah. I couldn't go outside to shoot nobody, because when I shoot people, I'm like... Very close. Within 10 feet. Right. So my whole job got shut down also, you know, along yeah. with everybody else's. But those, those collaborations kept me afloat that's dope man so uh go support if you're in zoomies yep if you uh if you uh what's the official website that people can just go purchase um estevan dot la or jokerbrand.com so go support go check out the uh exhibit it's in la i think until march 15th. no they extended it they did yeah because it's been doing i gotta so take good. my kids so yeah I've been telling Alan Strong I'm gonna take my kids to go check it out. I oh, it's like, cool, man. I, I've seen photos. It's it's because it's been a, 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 at least a month and a half or so. It's been there. Yeah, yeah. It's been there for a while. So go check it out. Go check out your. You got a whole area of it. Um, go follow this guy. You're a legend, man. Thank I look you, forward brother. to, to seeing you. what you got up your sleeve next. Yeah, it's coming. There it is, man. That's Devon. Appreciate you, brother. Hell yeah. Thank you, guys. Boom. Want to shout out to Hardeen, man. Hey, don't forget, this interview was brought to you by Hardeen. And when you're hitting Las Vegas, you got to stop off at Hardeen. Tell the Uber driver, the taxi driver, take me to Hardeen. They're going to take you. They're going to get you right. You know what I'm saying? 
Make sure you go visit him at uh, HardeenLasVegas.com. Go follow him, Hardeen underscore Las Vegas. And when you go and check out the most craziest premium selection of cannabis in the world, um, make sure I saw you tell them I sent you. They're going to get you situated. Salute to Hardeen. Thank you for watching.